Now, the case seemed to go cold until August 3rd, 2001. A contractor was digging an access road near Laurel Creek, which is around 30 miles away from Aisha's home, when he suddenly dug up something wrapped in a black trash bag. He opened it to see that it was a black backpack that had been double wrapped in two trash bags. Written on the inside of the bag was Aisha's name and her phone number. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. Welcome to episode 23. Today we're going to be talking about what happened to nine-year-old Aisha Degree. Now this happened over 23 years ago and even just saying that out loud is truly shocking. You know, the fact that it's been 23 years since Aisha was last seen by anyone. You know, cases where people just vanish are always so upsetting and so confusing and I just can't even imagine how the families must feel without having any answers as to what happened to their loved one. It's a very upsetting case, but it's also super important to talk about and bring awareness to it and just, you know, do as much as we can to keep Aisha's name out there. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to today's episode. With that, let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Aisha Degree. Aisha Degree was born on August 5th, 1990 in Shelby, North Carolina to parents Harold and Aquila Degree, who actually got married on Valentine's Day in 1988. She lived in a two-bedroom house just outside the city limits of Shelby with her parents and with her older brother, O'Brien, who was just a year older than her. Now, a little bit about the family dynamic. Both Harold and Aquila were extremely hardworking people. Aquila was a piano maker at a company and Harold worked the second shift as a dock loader at PPG Industries. Industries. So the two of them were like really busy. They were really hardworking people and oftentimes Harold would have to work very long shifts. As for their extended family, they were really close to most of them and actually the majority of their family lived in the same town. In fact, Aquila's mother lived right across the street and a couple of other family members lived down the street. So everyone was pretty much in close proximity to each other. So they would all often see each other and get together every Sunday to go to church, have family dinners, you know, things like that. Now, the parents were really overprotective of their kids. They pretty much only let Aisha and her brother interact with their other family members, such as their aunts, uncles, cousins, as well as other families that they knew from church. So because of this, Aisha was very cautious of strangers and she wouldn't really talk to people that she didn't know. She was even scared to pet other people's dogs. So she didn't like to do things that were outside of her comfort zone. There also wasn't a computer in the household. And the reason for this is because Harold and Iquilla were afraid that their children could fall prey to an internet predator. You know, I've talked about internet predators on this podcast before, and, you know, even if you have a family computer that's in the living room and gets checked by your parents every single night, things can still happen. You know, things can still slip through the cracks. So Aisha's parents just were not going to take any risks at all with the computer. Aisha and her brother also didn't have a cell phone or a separate phone line in the house. And for those who are not familiar with what a separate phone line is, because honestly, I couldn't even remember what what that meant. It's typically a phone number that would only go to one phone in the house. So for example, maybe the parents would have a phone in their house that had its own number. So if someone wanted to get in contact with the parents, they could reach them directly in their bedroom. Most of the time people would get a separate phone line because they wanted to have like more privacy, but the degree household did not have that. They just had one phone line that everyone would use. And again, I think it's just the parents way of trying to make sure that their kids were safe and were protected from all negative negative outside influences. So let's talk about Aisha. She was a nine-year-old little girl and she loved attending church with her family and she would always stay close to them. Her mom says that Aisha was just like her father. You know, she was really good at sports. She was quiet like him and she was just a daddy's girl. She was a really sensitive child, extremely smart and a very studious fourth grader. At the time of her disappearance, she was a student at Felston Elementary in Lawndale, North Carolina, which was about five miles away from their home. Now, people say that Aisha was really shy. You know, she kind of just like kept to herself and she was also very cautious about things. As I mentioned, you know, she was even scared of petting other people's dogs and speaking to strangers. So she was always very careful about what she was doing. She was also really scared of the dark and of thunderstorms. As for her school life, Aisha was really good at school and she loved science, she loved math, and she was often named student of the week and she almost had a perfect attendance. I believe she had only missed one day of school at this point. So, you know, her family and her took the academics very seriously. Now her friends describe her as being very lighthearted 
lighthearted. You know, she was funny and she was always happy. She would wear her hair in pigtails and in ponytails almost every single day. And people say that she was just a very likable person and that she made friends with everyone. As I mentioned earlier, her mother said that she was really into sports. So she was very athletic and she played basketball and baseball. But basketball was her favorite. And she was actually the point guard of her school's basketball team, which was called the Little Bulldogs. According to sources, Aisha was actually one of the star players on her team and she was really competitive. Her family says that they were all competitive but that Asia in particular was just like really into winning. Along with being very athletic, she was also creative. She dreamed of becoming a writer and an illustrator when she grew up, and she was just so ambitious that she even wanted to study science at Winston-Salem University. She was really close to her brother. They were like a year apart, so they would do a lot of things together, and he also played basketball, so they would bond over that, and every single day they would ride the bus to and from school together, and people say that O'Brien would would often walk Aisha to the door of her classroom before then going to his own classroom. So everyone says that he was such a good brother who looked out for his sister, which is really cute. The fact that he would like walk his little sister to the door and people say that they would see them playing basketball around the neighborhood together. So they just had a really close relationship. Now, since both parents worked a lot, they really were not home when the kids would get back from school. Because of this, Aisha and her brother were latchkey kids. And for anyone who doesn't know, a latchkey kid is a kid that usually like carries a key with themselves and will let themselves into the house all by themselves. The rules were that Aisha and her brother would get home, they would let themselves in, lock up, do their homework, and then they would stay inside until their parents would get home. The kids had to make sure to get home on time every single day, and if they did want to leave the house for any reason, they would have to stay nearby. Aisha and her brother were expected to have their homework completed before their parents came home. That way they could all have some family time, you know, watch some TV or have some dinner together. Harold and Aquila trusted their kids and had raised them well enough to know that they could take care of themselves before they returned from work. And on top of that, they had family that lived right across the street, you know, down the street. So they just felt totally safe in this neighborhood. So now that we know a little bit more about who Aisha was and about her home life, let's fast forward to the days leading up to her disappearance. The week before Valentine's Day, Aisha had won student of the week and she got to pick out whatever she wanted from her class's treasure chest. And she decided to pick out a black Tweety Bird purse, which she was really happy to get. And she was also proud that she was student of the week. On Friday, February 11th, 2000, school was closed for President's Day, but both her parents still had to go to work. So while her parents went to work, Aisha and her brother spent the day with her aunt. She actually took both of them to basketball practice. The two of them had very big games over the weekend so they spent the day at practice getting ready for that and Aisha was really excited about this game as I mentioned she was really competitive and she just absolutely loved basketball so she was excited to go play however her excitement was short-lived because on the day of her game which was on February 12th Aisha's basketball team lost it was just an off day for her you know she had been complaining of a leg injury before and during the game and then she actually fouled out with only three minutes left on the clock and she was really upset about this you know she was upset that she had fouled out of the game and then her team ended up losing the game just by one point Asia just felt like she really let her team down and she was just really disappointed in herself now, this was her team's first loss of the season, and she just took it really hard. She was actually seen crying with her teammates. Her mom and some of the other teammates had to console her and, you know, just kind of try to calm her down. Aquila just kept saying that the referees cheated, and that's why the other team won. But Aisha's coach didn't feel that the referee was being unfair to Aisha or to anyone else on the team. You know, it sucks that they did lose and that Aisha was so distraught over this. However, she did eventually move on from the loss, and by the time that her family headed over to her brother's game, she was happy again. After the game ended, Aisha went to a slumber party at her 15-year-old cousin, Katina's house. This was a sleepover with a bunch of her other cousins, and according to the family, Aisha was really happy that night. You know, she was dancing around with her cousins, and they all stayed up late watching television. Now, the next morning on Sunday, February 13th, 2000, Aisha's parents picked her up from her cousin's house and then the family headed over to church and arrived for the 11 a.m. service. Now, Aisha was really tired this day. You know, she had a pretty busy weekend. She had school, basketball practice, a basketball game, and then a sleepover with her cousin. So she was just really tired. Once church ended, the family all got together at Aisha's aunt's house and they spent the afternoon there. And then the degree family returned home in the late afternoon. 
afternoon. Some sources state that Harold went to work that afternoon and they kind of have like a different timeline. However, in an interview that Harold and Aquila did, they stated that the family watched a basketball game together that night at around 8.30 p.m. and that Harold or anyone else in the family never left the house. Now, it was also raining outside. It looked like a thunderstorm was about to erupt. So the family just wanted to sit down and watch a basketball game and just bond as a family. As they're doing this, the lights in the house suddenly go out. In fact, the lights on the entire street went out because someone was driving and had actually crashed into one of the electrical poles. So Harold gets up and he goes to the utility closet and he grabs a kerosene heater while Aquila lights candles. About an hour later, Aquila decides to put the kids to bed. Now, normally she would give them a bath before bed. That way in the morning when they would wake up for school, they could just be fresh and just like head to class. However, since the lights were out and there was a thunderstorm outside, she decided to hold off on the bath until the next morning. Aisha and her brother shared a bedroom, so Aquila went to their bedroom, tucked them in, and then said goodnight. She says that both kids quickly fell asleep. A little bit after midnight, the lights finally came back on in the house and in the entire street. And this is when Aquila decided that it was finally time for her to go to bed. However, Harold decided to stay up for some time because he wanted to wait for the kerosene heater to burn out. So he actually just stayed in the living room watching TV in the meantime. A few hours later, at around 2.30 in the morning, the heater finally cools down. So Harold decides that it's time for him to go to bed. Before going to his bedroom, he stops by the kid's bedroom and he sees that Asia and O'Brien are sound asleep. He closes their bedroom door and then he heads to bed. However, it seems like O'Brien wasn't like fully asleep because he says that once their dad left the room, he heard Aisha's bed squeak like kind of like make a noise. But he didn't think that she had gotten up to leave the room or anything like that. He just figured that maybe it was her rolling around in bed or something. So he didn't get up to check on her and he didn't even open his eyes. He just went back to sleep. At 5.45 a.m., Aquila woke up for the day and she started getting herself ready for work. She ran a bath for her kids since they didn't get a chance to have one the night before. And then at around 6.30 in the morning, Aquila went into Aisha and O'Brien's bedroom to wake them up. It was a Monday, so the kids had to go to school that morning. And Aquila and Harold actually had an appointment with a realtor to go look for a new home. It was also Valentine's Day and it was also their wedding anniversary. So it was definitely going to be a very busy day for the family. When she entered the kids' bedroom, she saw that O'Brien was asleep in his bed. But when she went to go check on Aisha, her bed was empty and she didn't appear to be in the room at all. She woke up O'Brien and said, where's your sister? And he says that he jumped out of bed and he ran over to his sister's bed and pulled the covers back and saw that the bed was empty. They had no idea what had happened to her. Aquila started searching the entire house, but Aisha was nowhere to be found. She even went outside to look in the backyard and the cars to kind of just like look around to see if maybe she was somewhere around there, but she didn't find her daughter. This is when Aquila wakes up Harold in a panic, telling him that she can't find Aisha anywhere. So Harold wakes up and tells her to call his mom, who was just down the street, because maybe Aisha had just gone over to her house. They called her, but she said that Aisha wasn't there. Aquila then called her mother because she didn't know what to do, and her mom said that she needed to call the police right now. So she threw the phone at Harold so that he could call 911, and Aquila ran outside to continue searching for Aisha. Harold called 911 at 6.39 in the morning, and told them that Aisha was missing and that her new Tweety Bird purse was also gone. He also told them that he didn't know what she was wearing that night. Now, let's hear a word from our sponsors today at Caraway. Have you ever gone onto WebMD or Google to look up why you might have a headache only to end up down a rabbit hole freaking out about a bunch of horrible conditions you don't even have? Let's not do that again. Talk to a real doctor instead and right away with Caraway. The Caraway app has all the care you need in one place. Their app is super easy to use and offers physical, mental, and reproductive health care tailored to fit your needs. With Caraway, you get unlimited 24-7 access to an experienced care team of doctors, therapists, psychiatrists, gynecologists, nurses, and health advisors, and more. And you'll always talk to a real person, not some AI robot. Caraway can help manage all of your different healthcare concerns, like getting medicine when you're sick, 
treating depression, or refilling birth control prescriptions. You can also message your care team to get quick answers to your questions, big or small, like why your headache won't go away, or you need to know if a mole looks normal. No more long wait time, surprise fees, or Googling your symptoms in a panic. Memberships start at less than $25 a month. That's less than your copay at Urgent Care, you guys. And all the care you receive from Caraway is covered by your membership fee, including therapy sessions. And if you need labs, in-person care, or prescriptions, your care team can coordinate with your doctors outside of Caraway and even help you navigate insurance questions. Right now, Caraway is offering new members 30 days completely free if you go to caraway.health slash what happened. There's no credit card required to try it. Get free and unlimited access to chat with their care team for 30 days. That's C-A-R-A-W-A-Y dot health slash what happened for 30 days completely free. Caraway is available in select states. Go to caraway.health slash what happened to learn more. And now back to the case. Police acted fast and they arrived to the degree home at 6.45 in the morning and they brought search dogs with them so that they would be able to track Aisha down. But unfortunately, the dogs weren't able to pick up a scent, which was really weird because they can actually pick up on smells from three days ago and the rain would have actually helped to make it easier. After looking around the house, investigators discovered that no locks or windows or anything had been broken. And in fact, all the doors and windows were still locked from the night before, including the front door. So there were no signs of a struggle or a forced entry and it seemed like Aisha had locked the door behind her when she left. Police determined that Aisha had disappeared from her bedroom sometime between 2.30 and 6.30 in the morning. By 7 a.m., all of the neighbors had seen that something was going on. You know, there was police cars and search dogs. So they all kind of just like dropped everything and they joined in on the search for Aisha. Also by 7 a.m., Aquila said that five or six local news stations had already shown up to the house and were already reporting on Aisha's disappearance. By 8 a.m., the search parties really started and they went on all day with more volunteers joining in on the search. You know, everyone in their neighborhood, their church, just the community was very concerned and they were trying to help find Aisha. At 12 p.m., a helicopter was also used in the search that had infrared heat detection. But the only thing that was found in the search was a winter mitten that Aquila confirmed did not belong to Aisha. The local news was reporting on Aisha's story, as I said earlier, and it helped the investigators get their first lead. Two truck drivers came forward saying that they saw a girl who matched Aisha's description walking along alone on Highway 18, which was a mile away from Aisha's house between 3.45 and 4.15 in the morning. Jeff Roop, one of the drivers, was 25 years old, and he was driving northbound and said that Aisha was walking southbound. Jeff specifically remembered seeing her because it was so laid out, it was raining, and on top of that, she wasn't even wearing weather-appropriate clothes. Now, he said that this girl was wearing a white dress, sneakers, and had a book bag, and pigtails. So the driver was obviously concerned about what this little girl was doing all by herself in the dark and he actually turned his truck around to try and talk to her to see what was going on and to see if she needed help. He said she never looked up at him when he tried to talk to her and he said that she was walking kind of fast, you know, like with a purpose as if she knew where she was going. So he turned back around and saw in his mirror that Aisha was heading into the forest. So the other truck driver was Roy Blanton Sr. who was in the truck with his son. He had thought it was possibly a domestic violence situation and that the girl had ran away but he was also concerned so he called out on his truck's radio to nearby truck drivers warning them about a person walking near the highway so that no one would accidentally hit them this was a very big tip and because of the direction that she was going detectives believe that Aisha was walking into the town of Shelby so on February 15th at three o'clock in the morning police set up a roadblock on highway 18 for three hours hoping to talk to someone who frequently drove that highway to see if they had seen anything the night before, but no one else had. Investigators continued their search focusing on Highway 18 to see if they could find any traces of Asia. On February 15th, the Turner family, who lived near Highway 18 on a large property, saw some members of the search party. The search party asked them to check their property, telling them that Aisha could be hiding there. They actually had a barn and a shed on their property that they hadn't had a reason to go into recently. So when the Turners checked their large shed, they actually found candy wrappers, a pencil, a green marker, and a Mickey Mouse hair tie. So all things that definitely appeared to belong to a child. Old. 
Also in the shed was a passport sized photo of a black girl around Aisha's age. But this photo wasn't actually of Aisha. It was a different little girl. So the Turners brought in the photo of the little girl to the police, but none of the other items. The reason they didn't bring the other items in right away is because they thought it was like random, like scattered garbage. But the photo of the little girl they brought in because they thought it was possibly Aisha. So the police showed the degrees this photo, but they didn't know the identity of the little girl in the picture. She wasn't a student at Aisha school she wasn't from their church no one in the degree family seemed to know who this photo was of so the turners were just thinking that all of this was unrelated to asia so they actually just kept the items that they had found in the shed on february 16th aquila searched asia's room to see if she could find any clues you know maybe something that was missing a note or an item that belonged to a potential kidnapper while looking through asia's room aquila realized that some of her favorite clothes were missing asia loved a pair of blue jeans with a red stripe in particular and aquila could not find them anywhere asia's backpack that had her house keys in them was also gone and so was her tweety bird purse a pair of her black shoes two long sleeve tops a vest a pair of overalls with Tweety Bird on them were all gone. So after sharing this information with investigators, they believe that Aisha must have packed her own bag to leave. Again, there was no sign of forced entry, so it did seem like Aisha had locked the door behind her on her way out and had run away, or at least left on her own accord. But luckily, since she was only nine years old, that didn't stop the police from searching for her. They weren't just like, oh, okay, she's a runaway, like, let's stop. Obviously, a nine-year-old girl cannot just be on her own. So they honestly still believed it was possible Aisha was later abducted, or that someone had helped her with this plan and had lured her away from her home. So on February 17th, investigators brought the truck driver, Jeff, back in and they gave him a polygraph test, which he passed. They also asked him to take them to the exact spot he saw Aisha heading away from the highway. And when he showed them, investigators realized Aisha had walked onto the Turner's property. So they started looking on the property and they found even more candy wrappers. They talked to the Turners again, asking if they had seen or heard anything else out of place and they said yes but that they didn't think that it had anything to do with Asia but this time they gave everything over to the investigators you know the candy wrappers the pencil you know everything else that they had found earlier and when police showed these items to Aquila and Harold they confirmed that the hair tie belonged to Asia also they knew that the candy wrappers were Asia's because it was the same candy wrappers from the Valentine's Day candy that Asia and the rest of her basketball team were given on Saturday after the game the pencil that was found was a 1996 at Atlanta Olympics pencil, which was interesting because the degrees had family in Atlanta. It was just a three hour drive away from Shelby where they lived and they actually had visited last summer. So maybe Asia picked up the pencil back then, but it was still confusing because, okay, Asia was here, but where did this photo come from? Police thought it seemed likely that Asia had taken shelter in the Turner shed the night after being scared by the truck driver. You know, like she was walking on the freeway, the truck driver spoke to her, she got scared. So she ran into the forest and she stumbled upon the shed and was hiding there and that's why all of her belongings were there. However, when police brought in the search dogs to the shed, they couldn't find a scent for her. And you know, okay, maybe that was still because of the rain and maybe Aisha was only in the shed for a short time, but the Turners also reported that their dogs would usually bark if they saw or heard any strangers around their property, but they hadn't barked that night, which is just shocking that the dogs didn't bark or anything like that. You know, maybe Aisha was just so tiny that they didn't notice her, or maybe she was just really quiet when she went into the shed, but it's still shocking that the dogs didn't like notice her or bark. Now, going back to the photo that was also found in the shed, it seemed like a good potential lead. So the police put the photo out to the public, hoping that someone could identify this girl but no one could. No one came forward saying that they knew who the girl in the photo was, which again is just so shocking. Something that's also interesting with Aisha's disappearance and the photo of the other girl is that Aisha's class had just finished reading a book called The Whipping Boy, where two boys run away together. So some thought that there might be some inspiration from that book to Aisha running away. The police spent seven days searching through a two by three mile area, and they also posted hundreds of flyers. The news also continued to report on Aisha and show images of her as well as a photo of the other girl. About 300 tips came in in response to the flyers and the police looked into all 300 tips and they fully investigated each one. Some tips suggested that Aisha could be hiding in some abandoned home or maybe had fallen into a well. Over 9,000 man hours were put into looking for Aisha, but after following up on each tip, 
ultimately, none of them led the police to Asia and the investigation came to a halt. Now, let's hear from Newly. Fall is here and I'm excited to put together some iconic fits with the help of Newly. Newly is a subscription clothing rental service. For just $98 a month, you can get trending fall pieces delivered right to your doorstep without dropping any serious cash. Whether you like cute tailored blazers, chunky knits, or formal dresses for dates, Newly is your new go-to outfit for every occasion. With Newly, you get to choose six styles each month based on whatever you have going on. It's totally up to you. You also get access to thousands of styles from more than 400 brands. Everything from party dresses to premium denim and one-of-a-kind vintage pieces. Newly carries labels like Free People, Selkie, Farm Rio, Anthropology, Eloqui, Madewell, and a Goldie. Newly offers inclusive sizing up to 5X as well as petite and maternity and fast free shipping and returns and professional cleaning and newly state-of-the-art laundering facility so all the clothes but no laundry for you to worry about and you always have the option to buy something if you really love it, sometimes up to 70% off. Newly renews your wardrobe for a low price and brings it up to speed for the season without breaking the bank. You can try new styles, sizes, trends, and more this fall when you rent with Newly and skip feeling that fast fashion ick. Plus, it's fun. Newly gives you everything you need to get inspired, get creative, and explore your style without making commitments. So you get to avoid impulse purchases and skip the buyer's remorse by renting instead. On top of that, it's it's flexible. You don't have to pay any fees, late fees, damage fees, or fees to pause or cancel. So no big deal if you lose a button, spill something, or just need to take a break. Newly is a great value at $98 a month for any six styles. But right now you can get $20 off your first month of Newly when you sign up with the code What Happened 20. Just go to n u u l y dot com. That's Newly with two U's and enter the code What Happened 20 and sign up to get $20 off your first month. That's N-U-U-L-Y dot com, Newly with two U's with code WHATHAPPEN20. Newly subscription clothing rental change your clothes. And now let's get back to the case. On February 20th, just seven days after her disappearance, the search was called off. But police did tell the local news to keep showing Aisha's photo and asking for tips. So the police just weren't going to be actively, you know, out there looking for her, but they would still follow up on any new leads. The Degree family was also offering a $5,000 reward to anyone who could help them find Aisha. A child interview expert also interviewed Aisha's friends and her classmates to see if maybe they knew anything. Several students said that Aisha had shown them money that she had in her wallet, but none of the students knew where she got this money from. Her parents say they don't know where she could have actually gotten this money from either. On February 22nd, a press conference was held to let the public know that the FBI had joined the investigation. The Degree family all took polygraph tests as well, which they all passed. And from the beginning, the police weren't really suspicious of the family. I was watching an interview with Aquila and she says that right away she offered to go and take a polygraph test and she's like, yeah, like test me, do whatever you need to do just to clear me so that you can get back to work and continue searching for my child. The police also came out and said the family was very cooperative. You know, they weren't suspicious. They weren't hiding anything. They opened up their house to investigators to search whatever they needed to search for. And again, it just did not seem like anyone in the family was involved. Now, the case seemed to go cold until August 3rd, 2001, almost 18 months after Aisha's disappearance. A contractor was digging an access road near Laurel Creek, which is just off Highway 18, which is around 30 miles away from Aisha's home. Home, when he suddenly dug up something wrapped in a black trash bag. He opened it to see that it was a black backpack that had been double wrapped in two trash bags. Written on the inside of the bag was Aisha's name and her phone number. So he actually went home after discovering this and he told his wife about this and he honestly just thought that this backpack had fallen off someone's car while they were traveling on the road. However, when he told his wife that Aisha's name was written inside the backpack, she immediately recognized that this was the missing nine-year-old little girl that was all over the news. She told her husband that they needed to call the police and report this. So the next day at 10 a.m., he called and reported the backpack. Police showed up and they locked off the area and nearby a pair of men's pants and animal bones were also found. And her backpack was found deep in the ground, so Aisha couldn't have dug this hole herself. 
Now, let's talk about what was found inside the backpack. They apparently found a pencil case and clothes. At the time, they said that 99.9% .9 of the items in this book bag were Aisha's. Then in 2018, which is crazy, that's like so many years after the backpack was found, investigators released images of two other items that were also found in the book bag. One was a Dr. Seuss book called McGilliot's Pool that was checked out from Aisha's school. Now, what's weird is that Aisha wasn't the person that checked this out from school. So whose book was this? There was also a new Kids on the Block nightgown, but Aisha didn't own a shirt or a nightgown like this. So these two items that were found in her backpack were not hers. Now, the reason they released this information is because they wanted anyone who owned this nightgown or had rented out the book from Aisha's school to come forward and say like, hey, that's my shirt or hey, I was the one that rented that book. You know, just to kind of like help police figure out how this ended up in her book bag. But I don't know why they waited until 2018 to release this information. Now, the FBI ran extensive DNA tests on the backpack, but the results were never released to the public. It's just really confusing. I mean, why was the shirt and this book inside her backpack if Aisha didn't even own these things? Now, when Aquila heard about the backpack being found, she freaked out. She said that she was scared that the next thing police were going to tell her was that they had found her daughter's body. In 2016, police stated that they had a new lead in the disappearance of Aisha. At this point, it had been 16 years since she was last seen and police were still investigating and they hadn't given up hope. This new clue was that someone matching Aisha's description was seen getting into a car on Highway 18, around the area where she was last seen, on the day she disappeared. This vehicle is described as a green early 1970s model car. I will put a picture of an example of the car on my YouTube video, but if you're listening to the audio version of this, I will also put it on my Instagram. The Cleveland County Sheriff named Allen said that the vehicle is considered a vehicle of interest. However, to this day in 2023, no more information about this vehicle has been released and it doesn't seem like police have found the owner of the car or who could have been driving it that day. Also, I wonder like, how did they get this new information? Like, why wasn't it until 16 years later that police found out about this car? Now, it's been 23 years since Aisha was last seen, and investigators have done over 300 interviews in regards to her case. Detectives say that they have spoken to numerous persons of interest, but that they're still looking for the person who did this. They still get so many tips in regards to Aisha's case. Some tips are repetitive, you know, things that they've already heard in the past, but other tips are new or old tips that have new information that they have to check out. So they're still accepting tips and every day they're just hoping that one will come in that will solve the case. It's just really hard because when Aisha disappeared, it was the year 2000 and there really wasn't any type of digital footprint that police could follow that, you know, could potentially lead to where Aisha is now. It's not like police can go through her iPhone and like track her that way and her family didn't have a computer. So it's just really hard to trace her digitally. The people in the community are still holding on to hope and are still spreading awareness on Aisha's disappearance. Her picture is posted on bulletin boards throughout the community as well as in billboards. Now, when Aisha first disappeared, everyone was just so shocked because it was such a small town and things like that just didn't happen there. In February of this year, the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office came out with a statement regarding Aisha's case saying, quote, over the years since she disappeared, the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office, the FBI, and the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation have followed hundreds of leads and conducted hundreds of interviews. Our goal has always been to uncover new information to help us find Asia and we still need your help. Now, the department actually gave her the nickname Shelby Sweetheart, and you know they're all just so heartbroken over what happened to her and how so many years have passed without answers. They said that they're still contacting anyone and everyone who may have been in contact with Aisha before she went missing. They urge anyone with information, whether you think it's helpful or not, to please come forward with that information because it could be the key to the case. The sheriff came out and said that somebody today will hear this message and maybe this person has been carrying the burden for the past 23 years because they actually know what happened to her and they're urging that this person relieves themselves of that burden. So if you know anything, please call 704-672-6100. You can also submit a tip directly to the FBI at tips.fbi.com. And just as a reminder, you you can make these reports and be completely anonymous. Aisha's family is still holding on to hope. Her mother, Aquila, spoke out in 2020 and said, after 20 years, I still believe my daughter is alive. I do not believe she is dead and I know someone knows something. 
I'm not crazy enough to think that a nine-year-old can disappear into thin air without somebody knowing something. Which is so understandable. I feel like any mother or parent would continue to hold on to hope for as long as possible. You know, even though so many years have passed by, the family is just as heartbroken over this and it's so difficult for them. Her mother said that there are some days where she doesn't even want to wake up or get out of bed because she's just so upset over her daughter's disappearance. Her main motivation to keep going and waking up every single day is her other children and her husband. She says that if she stops moving, then her family stops moving. So she knows that she has to keep going, you know, keep living life for them. As of today, there is still a $45,000 reward being offered for any information that may lead to Aisha's whereabouts or to answers as to what could have happened to her. $20,000 was raised by the community and by Aisha's family, and then the other $25,000 was actually added by the FBI. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is an organization that I have mentioned on this podcast before, they are such an amazing organization that advocates for missing children, and they help the families create age progress photos and you know put billboards up and things like that. They created this age progress photo of what Aisha would look like now as a 33 year old woman. So I will put that on the screen here if you're watching this on YouTube and I will also put it on my Instagram. Every year Aisha's family does a walk with several other members from the community and even from people from the police department. They all walk the last road that Aisha walked down and they make it all the way up to the billboard that was put up there that displays her picture. The family just doesn't want to give up hope and I truly hope that they do get the answers that they're looking for and that Aisha is found. As I mentioned earlier in the video, you know, that morning that Aisha disappeared, her parents had an appointment with a realtor to look for a new home. Well, after she went missing, they actually stayed in the same house for two decades, hoping that Aisha would come home eventually and that she would find her way back there. Now, since then, they actually have moved into a new home, but it wasn't an easy decision for them. Aquila came out and said, no matter where we live, we are always going to be her parents and we are going to always be looking for her. I wish there was a better ending to this. You know, I wish that Aisha had been found and that this was a survivor story, you know, something like that. But unfortunately, it's just not the case here and I do just quickly want to go over a couple of theories that people have as to what could have happened to her as well as some questions that people have regarding the case. Before we continue, let's hear from our sponsors at Factor. With the busy fall season already starting, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for your jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy this fall to cook, but you wanna make sure that you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and all the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy and then get back to living your life. Level up your meals with gourmet plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in no time. Treat yourself to fancy meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash whathappen50 and use code whathappen50 to get 50% off. That's code whathappen50 at factormeals.com slash whathappen50 to get 50% off. And now let's get back to the case. Now, a lot of people think that the trucker signaling Aisha being there, you know, on the highway possibly made her a target for a predator. So, for example, when the trucker radioed in to other truckers, letting them know like, hey, like there's someone walking along the highway by themselves, like just be careful so you don't hit her. Maybe someone heard that radio call that was a predator and you know, found that this was like an easy target, you know, someone walking by themselves at four o'clock in the morning in the rain and they decided to pull up to where she was and take her. That's a theory that a lot of people believe could have possibly happened. There's also this other theory that I saw, which was kind of like 
out there but a lot of people believe that the girl in the picture that was found in the shed which again is not Asia, was another victim and that maybe Asia had a pen pal and that the pen pal was pretending to be this girl that was in the picture and maybe had sent this picture to Asia, being like hey this is what I look like and they had planned to meet up or something like that and that's why the photo was in her backpack but in reality, this pen pal was a catfish. You know, the person writing to Asia wasn't the little girl in the photo, but it was actually a predator. That one I found to be really interesting because the fact that so many years have passed by and no one has come forward saying that they're the person in the picture or that they know who that person is, makes a lot of people wonder, you know, maybe it was like a Photoshop photo or it just was like a fake photo. It's just, the photo is just like a really interesting aspect of the case. If you look at the photo, like the top part of her body is like crystal clear, but like the bottom part is a little bit blurry, which is why some people think that the photo might be fake and like Photoshop. Now, the girl that she was pen paling with, you know, or the potential catfish, like a lot of people wonder, like the shirt that was in the backpack, the new kids on the block shirt, like, is that the pen pal shirt or whose shirt was that? Because it wasn't Asia. So how did she get all of that stuff there? Now, a lot of people think that Asia went out that night to meet someone, possibly a predator, as I mentioned, but if that was always a plan why did they make her walk so far you know it's just confusing as to why she would go all the way on the highway by herself you know possibly go into this shed as part of the plan like why wouldn't they just like meet her down the street or something like that it's just really confusing as to why a nine-year-old little girl would leave the house all on their own in the middle of the night especially because Aisha was afraid of the dark and she was afraid of thunder so why would she willingly go into that by herself going back to the shed a lot of people truly believe that Aisha was never in the shed in the first place some people believe that those items were planted there because it did just seem so random like all the items found were just scattered there and the fact that the dogs never barked they never saw someone there and like alerted the family and the fact that the search dogs never picked up on Asia's scent is just very confusing so i've seen a lot of people believe that someone just placed those items to mislead police you know to make them think that Asia had gone to the shed to hide or to just like find shelter for some time and then just casually left the stuff there and then moved on to her next location especially because the items found were kind of just like random you know like candy wrappers the hair tie the pencil the marker it just seemed like why would Asia had left these things behind you know why did she decide to take those specific things out but then continue carrying on her backpack so again just a lot of people just believe that this was a setup you know like a scene just to confuse police and you know Asia was like very responsible she was like a very well-behaved girl so I don't feel like she would have just like left like garbage there like her candy wrappers and just like left stuff on the shed that she didn't even know who belonged who this belonged to it just it honestly doesn't seem like this was her now a theory that is actually on the fbi's website is that maybe her basketball game had something to do with her disappearance as i mentioned earlier two days before asia disappeared she fouled out of a basketball game and her team ended up losing by one point this really upset her and she was really competitive and she absolutely loved basketball and her team and she was just heartbroken over this so the fbi believes that maybe she was so upset about the game that she decided to go home pack a bag and just run away especially because asia seemed like a perfectionist you know she had perfect grades perfect attendance did everything by the books and listened to her parents so maybe because of her parents expectations she put a lot of pressure on herself and she didn't know how to deal with the failure even if it was just like a simple basketball game i mean that could be a possibility i feel like when you're young and you lose a game or you lose a competition or something happens at school it can send you over the edge and it can feel like it's the end of the world i remember i played basketball in high school and when i would lose a game like we would all be so upset over it and now I don't even think about that game anymore so at the time it just seems like it's the end of the world and maybe she was just so upset about it that she did decide to leave either way detectives do truly believe that she is the one that packed her bag herself because the items inside look like something that a child would pack not something that her parents would pack for her to like go to school or something so she could have willingly left on her own or she could have been lured by someone either way police believe that someone did play a role in what happened to her and that they told her where to go or how to leave her house the question is who is this person and why why did they want Asia to leave the house Going back to the money that her friends say that Aisha was showing them, where did she get this money from? We haven't been able to find like an exact amount of money that she had, but if her parents don't even know where she got that money from, it's also just like, 
how what is that what is the deal with that like does it have something to do with her disappearance possibly now this next statement that i read was pretty shocking according to the star they reported that in 2020 a prison inmate named marcus mellon wrote a letter to the news stating that he knew how asia was killed and where to find her now a little bit about marcus he's a 53 year old man and he was convicted of sex crimes against children in cleveland county in 2014. in this letter he says that he has information about asia and that this information needs to be passed along to the FBI. He told investigators that they needed to come speak to him in person to find out more. And this is what he specifically wrote in the letter. Asia Degree has been missing for over 20 years. About four months ago, I had found her whereabouts and what had happened to her. She was killed and then took and buried. I do know how and what town she is in. I hope you get this letter and do come see me. It's on the up and up. Now, the Cleveland County Sheriff, Allen, says that the tip will be followed up on, but that certain obstacles will slow the process. Now, the obstacles that he's talking about is COVID because this inmate sent the letter in 2020. So at the time, going to visit him in prison was difficult with COVID restrictions. So he said that once the prison situation was under control, they would go through with the process. Now, I really wasn't able to find an update on this now in 2023 if they have been able to go speak with him. However, at the time, the sheriff stated that sometimes inmates have ulterior motives and that they lie about these things. You know, they lie about knowing valuable information so that they could kind of get like an incentive, you know, maybe get their time removed from their sentence or they can get special treatment in prison, you know, things like that. So he said that you always have to be careful while listening to an inmate's tip. So I don't know what happened with that. If there is ever any updates, I will definitely let you guys know. I just wish that there was answers to this case and my thoughts and prayers go out to Aisha's family. Just to think that this little nine-year-old girl was out there all alone in the rain and in the dark at four o'clock in the morning on this highway is so frightening and sad. I wanna end today's episode with a quote from Aquila. She said, this is worse than death because at least with death, you have closure. You can go to a gravesite or if you have the urn at home but for us we can't mourn we can't give up the only thing we got is hope and with that that is all the information that i have for today's video it's such a sad case asia is just a little girl and it's sad that so many years have passed without answers my heart breaks for her family and i just truly hope that they all get the answers that they're looking for soon thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to asia degree if you're watching this on youtube make sure to leave me a comment down below so i can see your thoughts on this case if there's ever any other cases that you would like me to cover also leave me a comment under my youtube video or you guys can send me a message on instagram but yeah that's pretty much everything i have on today's case don't forget to follow rate and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my channel true crime jackie on youtube for full video episodes you can also find me on instagram and on tiktok at true crime jackie bye guys